Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is where you are at. This is Plot Twist, please. I'm Shamaya. It's like papaya, except it's not. Wow, I am recording on my laptop, with my laptop on my lap, so if this screen starts shaking a lot, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> which it might, so this is probably not a good idea, but we're in it now. I should make better choices. Do I? Mm, it is hot in my apartment. It's really, really hot. I've never sweat more in my entire life, in my entire adult. This is something else, child. This is something else. I don't know what's happening. Maybe it's a combination of stress, the impeding doom of the universe. I don't know if it has something to do with me getting older. Oh, speaking of me getting older, my birthday's coming up so, so soon. And first of all, raise your hand if birthdays make you nervous. I can't see your hands, but I can sense them. Here's the thing. You can either do a birthday the easy way or you can do it the hard way. And a lot of people choose the hard way, including me, a Leo. I bring this upon myself. So what I do is I hike up the expectation of my birthday until it becomes an unreachable goal. Why don't we just expect less? Why don't people expect less? Honestly, that should have been our model for 2020 considering how things are going. We should have just been like, Happy New Year, everyone. The better than nothing is yet to come. One of the things, one of those things I like to point out is picnics. I've had so many picnics with friends in the last six months than I could have ever imagined in my childhood dreams. It's been great. Like, not gonna lie. Um, not saying that quarantine and COVID is something that <laughs> pumping me up with endorphins, but we are spending more time outside than we probably ever have and ever will. I I'm contemplating camping. Why not just like completely plunge into mother nature and hope that you land on solid ground or soft ground, whichever keeps you in one piece at the end of the day. Oh, why didn't y'all tell me about Umbrella Academy? Why didn't y'all tell me? It's lit. It's, it's really lit. It's great. I dig the plot line. I dig the kooky characters. You know how I dig kooky. You know how I love the kookiness. I think it's like two seasons in. I haven't watched all the first season, but I dig it. I am picking up a shovel and digging it. I haven't been evicted yet, so that's good. Um, what other good things have been happening in my life? Ooh, ooh. Okay, hopefully you've checked out my Friday faves because I post them every Friday on the blog. So pause this and go read the blog right now so we can chat about it because I made... Um, this like, I don't know, I don't know, I, here's my thing. I love to cook. I love to make new concoctions and new creations and to experiment on my little lab kitchen, but I never know what to call things. I don't know what things are called. In a general sense, I don't really know things. Like I made something with like pita bread and hummus and I spread the hummus on the pita bread. And then I had like, um, I had some roasted kale and some tomatoes diced diced and then i had like lemon pepper seasoning and some onions and i put that on top of the pita bread pork i put pulled pork in there seasoned the heck out of it because i wasn't <laughs> raised wrong i don't know what it's, it's called if you know what it is called please feel free to dm me on on instagram because i don't know what things are called yeah i'm worried about me too does this look like the face of someone who's mad about it because it ain't. Yeah, I'm going to try to stay on topic this time because sometimes I just kind of go off on a tangent. Self-criticism thing. We love it. We eat it up. Self-criticism. She's our best friend. So I'm going to grab my notes because I have my notes. You know I do. And um, we're just going to hop right into this dumpster fire, shall we? So why black women can't afford to be your superheroes? First of all, I'd like to point out that the term superhero as it pertains to black women or the idea of strength as it pertains to black women is complicated. Positive connotation, it seems, right? As much as we would like to think that a band-aid could stop a gunshot wound, it just doesn't. So what this actually turns out being is a marketing ploy to think that we've actually made progress when systematically nothing has changed. I realized I wasn't looking at the camera this entire time. I'm so rude, my mother raised me better than that. I'm gonna look at you in the eye like you matter because you 
do. So here's the thing. Saying that Black women are strong or that we're superheroes doesn't alleviate the issue of dehumanizing us because a superhero, though they're not a pet, is still not human, right? And actually, we need to go back and look at the history of painting Black women as superheroes or as these superhuman beings that have um, superseded the realm of humanity, right? We need to go back and look at the history of those kinds of tropes because you have the Jezebel trope, the Mammy trope, the strong woman trope, aka the sapphire trope. So basically all of these tropes combined feed into the idea that Black women are here to serve other people, to not serve themselves, to feed the narrative of somebody else's story that doesn't highlight their own experience and their complexities as human beings. When you think we're goddesses, you think we don't need healthcare. When you think we're goddesses, you think we don't need mental health aid. You think we don't need care. You think we don't need protection by the law. We do. It feeds into this mentality of the, you can't hurt black women because they're indestructible. It's like, we would like to not have to be strong. That would be quite ideal. So let's talk about culture because meme culture actually feeds into this idea of black women being beyond humanity, basically. There are so many memes that make a joke out of black women's pain. The Breonna Taylor memes, even though they might be well-intentioned, Megan the Stallion memes about how she got shot and people were literally, not even, here's the thing, not even five minutes after it came out in the news, people were already on Twitter, already laughing. That's the scary thing is it was immediate. There was no pause to be like, ooh, like, is she, is she okay? Like, is she good? It was automatically with the jokes. That should concern us. And Here's the more concerning thing. It wasn't necessarily just white people. It was black people, particularly black men. And here's the thing. Black men have a history of habitually throwing black women under the bus. All right. So we're, we're just going to talk about that because it happens far too often. And it's to the point where it's just become the standard. Think about the ain't nobody got time for that meme. You think about the by Felicia meme and the list goes on and on. It just has become so normalized. Even black comedians make fun of us. And, and here's the thing too, like people like to say, well, jokes are jokes and like funny is funny and everyone is you know, everyone is fair game. But I, I certainly, and I, I think I, I felt this way for a long time. Comedy does well at pointing fun at the people who are already in power. But where comedy messes up sometimes is making fun of the people who are already getting stomped on by society. It's lazy humor to make fun of people who are living with mental illnesses. It is lazy to make fun of black women. It is lazy to make fun of disenfranchised communities. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. Also, along with meme culture comes entitlement, where we feel like we as consumers of media think that it is our right. Megan posted a tweet where she was like, hey guys, like this isn't funny. Like I'm actually in pain here and it's really a shame that you think this is something to be laughed at. Um, and people literally were coming for her. Let us, like this is us having our fun, like go back to your corner. Like what? Like really? Basically saying your humanity is an inconvenience to us, right? Because if we think that everything that is put out here, especially as it pertains to Black people, is just for our consumption and that there's not a person behind it, what does it say about us? And this is the price that is paid when Black women are viewed as indestructible is we think that nothing can hurt them. And this goes back to slavery where Black people were viewed as literally having thicker skin. And so um, gynecologists ran experiments on Black women. Um, doctors ran experiments on slaves because it was believed that we didn't feel pain as much as white people. And it was believed that we could handle more labor because we were built stronger. So you, it, you see how that becomes problematic because the superhuman trope creates the illusion of progress while actually feeding into the exact systems and the exact ideologies and pathology that contributes to the unapologetic harm toward Black women. We think it's progress, but it ain't. I mean, I just, I just crushed somebody's dreams, but it was time. 
black women didn't ask for this. We didn't ask to be your superheroes. That was something that was put on us. I think about, you know, our black heroes, Harriet Tubman. I think about Rosa Parks. These women had feelings. But what's interesting to me, and I talked about this in the panel that I just released last week. Um, you can find that on YouTube. Shameless plug. Um, also, you can listen to it on the podcast. But something that I find interesting is the idea that somebody brought up on the panel that maybe these figures of ours, these important figures, had to put on this facade of being strong because they, they knew that what they were doing was historic and they knew that it was notable and that people were going to pay attention. It's important that we make note of that, the possibility that these women had to put on this brave face because they knew history would have to remember them that way. You know, women like me and generations forward would need to look up to them and would need to, would need to see these pillars of strength to pull from. But that doesn't mean it's healthy. It doesn't mean that they, they didn't suffer. Odds are they did. Odds are they, wait for it, cried a lot. And see, that's why I love shows like How to Get Away with Murder, where it is just so open and you see Black women at their best and you see them at their worst. It's why I love um, depictions of Black women that are multifaceted and honest because no one is perfect. No one is the stoic figure that handled everything the right way. No one, no one is this pillar of strength or perfection all the time. The superwoman trope is very closely linked to respectability at times because you often see them as regal and it's this personification of a historic figure that is most palatable for white people. What you're saying is, the Black women that are worthy of sympathy or worthy of being highlighted are the ones that fit into a narrative that white people can respect. And that doesn't, that's a little smushy to me, right? That's a little crunchy. It's not only perpetuated by white people. Like I said, it's perpetuated by Black people, by our mothers, by our fathers, by our family members who tell us that sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. <laughs> Let me tell, words hurt, okay? I am a sensitive person and they hurt. Things affect us. And something affecting us does not make us less admirable. Personally, I'm inspired by the people who show their pain, who show their pitfalls, who show the mess, and then show, hey, I got out of it. Or, hey, I had to figure it out, or I had to ask for help, or I had to cry a lot, or I had to scream, I had to punch a pillow, I had to go to therapy. I love stories of broken people. And I do think it's a generational thing as well, because I think for a long time, it was not acceptable to be, a, <laughs> to be a multifaceted Black woman, especially in the workplace. If you were at a certain level of income, of social class, your coin was dependent on how together you needed to seem and how unwavering you needed to be, which provides another complication for Black women because, especially in corporate America, it is so easy, far too easy, for you to be perceived as aggressive or unlikable. And then that is docked against you. So really what I'm saying is we can't win. And it, it's so interesting to me too, because I, I feel like unless a black woman is crying, she seems aggressive. Like if she's showing emotion besides tears, she's aggressive. And that feeds into the criminalization of black women and black girls. It, if the well is dry, then there is no empathy. It's also so interesting to me how easily the oppressed can become the perpetrators of the oppression. So when I talk about Black communities and how Black women are kind of supposed to be the pillars of strength, it feeds into how other Black women treat us as well. And it sucks. <laughs> though I get where that comes from and though it's rooted in trying to protect in the end, it doesn't do anything but ostracize the people who don't fit in that narrative. So if you're saying, okay, the only noteworthy Black women are the ones who don't show emotion or who, are, who appear to be these pillars of unbreakable strength, then what you're saying in tandem, indirectly, is that the women who don't, the Black women who don't exhibit those qualities are not notable or are not inspirational. I feel like people are just now getting used to the idea 
of black women being vulnerable, including us, including black women. Like this is, this is a new avenue for a lot of us, you know, being open. And I'm very open on my platform, as you probably know, um, especially when it first started out, I was very open about my experiences. Um, but I, I honestly, I have to attest that to being raised the way I was raised. I just, both of my parents were very overt about their emotions and my, my father specifically, and I think this, this had more to do with it than my mother being emotionally driven, not emotionally driven, but she was just very emotionally open. She was very emotionally vulnerable with you. Oftentimes she wouldn't put up a front, you know, she was, if this was how she felt, this is how she felt. And she wasn't trying to hide it from anybody. Um, but I think specifically my dad, my dad was a great example of that because within black communities, you just don't see that with black men. You don't see them being like, oh, this hurt me. Or like, I, I, I love you. And I want you to know that every single day. And that, that's something that my dad legitimately does. He, you know, he tells us he loves us often, really often and out of the blue. And I'm grateful for that because I don't think that a lot of black families have that. I just don't think that that's embedded in our culture. Um, so I think that's a large part of why I am the way that I am and why I'm so open about my emotions, whether or not they benefit me in terms of how I express them, in terms of who I express them to. I'm just, I'm very open in that way because that's just what I'm used to. And <laughs> you can hear the cicadas. Hey, cicadas, how you doing? It's fine. But anyway, like I was saying, I was raised by, very, by two very emotionally vulnerable parents. And I think that helped me. And also my dad is a musician. So like there's emotional vulnerability there as well. So why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about black women? Why am I talking about the superwoman trope? Because it affects our health. The rates to which black women die in childbirth, which is at a far higher rate than our white counterparts, because A, our pain isn't taken seriously when we say something doesn't feel right, gynecologists don't listen to us. And we are stressed to death. <laughs> like literally we, we can contract chronic illnesses. My mother was one of those people. And so many black women end up in their 30s getting chronic illnesses because of stress and because of the pressure of being a black woman in the workplace, being a black woman raising black children in an anti-black world, being a black woman in a relationship. And Lord, Lord, I need to do a video on black women in relationships because whether you are with a black person or a non-black person, it's a trip. It's a trip. Believe it. Believe you me. I'm just going to stick a pin in that. I say all that to say that we need to start treating black women like people first. We can either make those sort of accommodations within our institutions, within our corporations, within the healthcare system, within government, within policy, or get left behind. Because the world is shifting and black women are demanding more. And when black women want something, we fight for it. We're so used to fighting other people's battles, but now we're ready to fight our own. And I don't know if y'all ready for that. I gotta be honest. I do not know if corporations are ready. A lot of us think that those things aren't attainable. But once we realize as a collective that these things are not only attainable, but that they're valid and that we deserve them, then these corporations are going to be in trouble. We're not there yet. I don't think we're there yet. I think we still have people who are wondering whether or not they deserve to get free health care or whether or not they deserve a quality of life that they only watch on TV with predominantly white actors. I think a lot of us are still trying to decolonize ourselves. The day we realize that will come, and when it comes, the world needs to be ready. But what I often hear is, if Black women are so upset with the system, why don't we just change how we go about it? Why don't we just fit into these boxes that are set before us? Why don't we just maneuver in these tiny spaces to get what we want? A lot of us aren't willing to do that anymore. I certainly am not. I bought a different ticket and I'm on a different train. So it's not about changing the product, quote, quote, anymore. It's about changing the market. We have to change the market. I saw this video by Angela Rye on Instagram. She was like, just like, go where the love is. Don't bother with the people who don't love you. Go to where you are welcomed and go to where you are valued. Because it's not worth it to try to make someone care about you, to try to convince 
someone that you're worthy of care, you know, just in our interpersonal lives, in our jobs. Like, and I know sometimes we have to do what we have to do to do what we need to do. And I get it. But when we can, it is just, it's so beneficial for us to really analyze our surroundings and determine whether or not they are serving us. So I just would like to leave off on that note. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with your buds or your foes or the people who you're kind of on the fence about but you think they could be cool. Share it with them too. And leave a comment if you want. I don't know, maybe you're not doing anything. Leave a comment, go ahead. What you doing, what you doing right now? Watching TV, leave a comment, leave the comment. Please stay weird, stay well, and stay out of my business. Just kidding, I have no secrets. Okay, bye. Ah!